So the higher you go up in these organizations, the more lonely these leaders are and the less they have people lead. That's why they join these groups like Vistage and everything else to, to find other people who they can identify with. And those are, that's how lots of great deals are created between organizations because they're going to places where they feel like these are people that understand them and who know them, right? And that's how great marketing and sales is done in the first place is you just, you know who you're talking to, you know what their problems are, you have advice or solutions or something, and that's super helpful. But if they don't know you exist, what good does it do anybody? <laughs> Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCusta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. All right. Uh, welcome to 99 Humans, Kurt. Thanks for being here. Now, as you know, we're exploring leadership from a more human angle, and I can't wait to talk with you more. A published author, podcast host, you took 20 plus years of agency experience with you as uh, now the president of a successful company, hitting things like Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing companies. And you could forgive somebody like myself for finding that list of accomplishments a little bit intimidating. Uh, and so I'd love to start out just by hearing a, a time, a story where your leadership journey ran into that more human side of leadership. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm really excited. So what what day doesn't it run into the human side of things? But I can one story sticks out to me that I can I can tell you about that. When I was first starting out my career, I thought I do what everybody else does and join a giant corporation where I could just sit there for 30, 40 years and marinate and then retire peacefully. But I found that that was soul sucking and I hated every every minute of it. So I joined the circus, which means agency life, and started working for a number of agencies as I grew in my career. And then eventually we started our own, which is Foundry, which is the one you just mentioned. And But early on in one of my agencies, I remember um, being promoted and I had to sit down with a, um, a very tenured project manager and I had to do their annual review. Now, I hadn't hired this person, but I now as the leader had to do their annual review. So I sat down with them and I said, hey, you know, I don't really know a lot about what you've done over the last year. Tell me about it. Tell me about what you're looking to do. What are your goals for this year? And they're like, well, I don't really want to talk about all that stuff because I've been here a year, so you should just promote me and we'll call it a day. And I was like, oh, what? what, what? And turns out that that person was very much used to a more structured corporate environment hmm. where after a certain amount of time, you did get automatically promoted. But this was an agency. This is a place where you kind of had to do the job before you got the job sort of environment. And when I explained that to this person, they were very confused. And I remember driving home that day and thinking, I've got to get better at this leadership stuff because I was completely just stuck. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to say. And I felt really inadequate to be having that conversation. And I remember that as a turning point on when I started to take the idea of leadership as a kind of skill set and not just a title very seriously. Well, I want to hear what you've done with that skill set since then. But before <laughs> that, if we go back to that moment, even before, let's say, so you're yeah. about to walk into the room, maybe the virtual room for this performance review. What what goes through your mind for performance reviews? You know, how do you how do you prepare for that? Or do you just kind of show up and hope that it manifests to you in the moment? Well, my hope is, is that it's never a surprise that the performance review should be exactly that, a review of everything that both of you know and understand. Back then, to the, if you were pointing out that exact moment, I had none of that data. I had none of that information. I hadn't built a relationship with that person where they understood what my expectations of a good job were and that I understood what they were capable of. I had none of that. And I think from then on, understanding that 
uh, performance review is just kind of a, a period on the end of a very long essay that you have with that person over the course of the time between performance reviews. And so for me, it was about really understanding how am I judging performance as a leader? And does that person understand how they're being judged? Because I remember somebody, I have bad leaders. I think that's the people who I learned the most from is bad leaders versus good leaders. And I remember those people moving targets on me or pulling rugs out from underneath me or all those things and understanding that it wasn't because they were maybe malicious people, but because they weren't trained. They didn't, this wasn't their, this wasn't their calling. I remember my very worst performance review, like it was yesterday. And I walked <laughs> into the room and my manager had a pencil, but no paper, no anything. And I just still remember that being like, what was the pencil what for? Was what, for? Was, what was going to happen? <laughs> so they walk in, kind of say, this isn't going well. I ask some questions, don't get any answers, and then leave the room pretty confused. So I, I, it, obviously that stuck with you. I love uh, that. Yeah, I love that you bring that up because that's the other thing that I've coached a lot of leaders on is visual cues in leadership. People do not understand how much employees pay attention to what the leaders are doing and not doing. I remember when we first started our agency, myself and my partners would usually go to lunch around 1130. And I noticed over time that the entire staff started taking lunch at 1130. Now we never instituted a policy or a procedure or anything. But what I realized over time was these were visual cues we were giving off to people on what is acceptable, what is great, what is good. And so there are so many things you do as a leader that are not just vocalized, that have a real impact on people. So to your point, if I walked in a room and I just sitting there twirling a pencil in front of an employee, they're probably going to be like, what the hell's the... <laughs> What the hell's the pencil for? <laughs> you know, is this like, you know, the dark night? Is it you know make the pencil disappear, right? Or <laughs> when you say something like that, yeah, right. Please no, <laughs> not that kind of review. <laughs> Kurt, when you say that, there's a part of me that goes, Yeah, that's true. I can recognize in, in my team's kind of yeah. cultural norms, things like that, that that's happened. But also there's a part of me that goes, Oh, that sounds exhausting. Yeah. People are going to be watching literally every single thing that I do and emulate yep. that or choose to judge that. Am I taking that comment the right way? And, and how do yep. you find the energy management of that fact that everything you're doing is under a microscope? Yeah, well, I mean, you can't turn off leadership. You can't you can't leave it at the door when you go to lunch and you take employees out for a happy hour. You can't you can't you still are that that person, right? I remember I remember when I was six or seven years old and we ran into um, one of my teachers in the grocery store and it was freaky because I was like, oh my gosh, seeing them out of their element, that was weird, right? Because, You're a real person. Yeah, it's like, yeah, but but yeah, exactly. But that that feeling never goes away. <laughs> like it still happens as you get older. So so you know, you could be at the state fair and run into your your boss and their family. And it's awkward. It's always going to be awkward. Like, and so you, you can't, once you're in that role, you can't just turn it off. And I, and I'm sorry, I wish, I wish people could, but you know, yeah, it is, it can be exhausting, but this is what you signed up for. So you have done this to yourself. <laughs> I like that. Uh, it, it, it makes me think of, you know, the, the cliche almost of bring your authentic self to work. And yeah. one might say, then, then maybe you don't have to turn it off because you're never turning it on. There you go. But also, something does change, you know, in the what's appropriate, what's expected, what's the what's going to happen. So I'm I'm curious yeah. for your take yeah. on what what does authenticity mean to a leader who is always going to be looked at differently than everyone around them? Yeah, authenticity is a tricky word, right? Because it it means different things to different people, right? So some people, when they hear authenticity, they think well, now I have to show up completely vulnerable and I have to share things that I wouldn't normally share. Well, I don't, you know, as a leader, you know, when the meeting's getting started, I don't want to hear about your your dating life. Like that isn't being vulnerable. That's being weird and uh, inappropriate, you know. But if you're nervous about the meeting, if you're worried that maybe this client's going to be really mad or something when you get on the phone call, it would be good to hear that because probably everybody else is feeling that way. And it's okay to show that you're nervous as well. So when I say authenticity, 
when I hear the word authenticity, I mean being real with other people. Now, obviously, as a leader, you need to show confidence. You need to show strength in terms of, you know, well, maybe we just had some layoffs, right? We've been dealing with a lot of those lately, right? And so, but if if those layoffs are for a reason to build the company to a new place, as a manager who maybe had to lead those layoffs, you have to show confidence that that was for a reason and it's for your benefit for the people who are here, but you, you don't also have to say you liked it. <laughs> you know, you, also, you know, you don't have to say that it was pleasing for you to do. Uh, but you also don't need to cross the line and then, you know, start crying and talking about, you know, yourself and how it affects you. Like who cares how it, <laughs> who cares how it affects you, but do show me that you're a human being. Mm. So when you think back on that, experience that you shared at the beginning with yeah. this employee, you know, the performance review where you look back and go, gosh, there's some tools here that maybe, maybe <laughs> I need to build for myself and use. Did you ever have the chance to use a new tool set with this employee or was that an experience and a person that was just part of your journey and, and helping you get better from there? Yeah, honestly, that person ended up leaving within about six months or so of the organization. I think they weren't happy with the leadership change a la me. And, and because, you know, I wasn't running, you know, sort of a check mark sort of team. I, I, you know, I was running a team that I was judging people based on, you know, their motivation, their, their output for sure. Right. But I needed to understand, were they part of a team or were they just on a team because the company said they had to be on a team? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it became very clear that this person was on a team because the company said they should be on a team, not because yeah. they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. That fact that leaders use other experiences with other humans to get better yeah. kind of makes me uncomfortable Yeah, and still yeah. feels very true, right? Like, yep. Every day is a playground where I'll, I could make a mistake. It could really impact a human yep. being and I'll learn from that mistake and I'll get better. That's right. But it doesn't change the fact that it still impacted that human being. And it feels like those stakes are, are quite high. They can uh, be. Whether we realize them or not. They can be. I mean, my, my company, you know, we have about 30 full-time employees and I'm responsible for a lot of mortgages, <laughs> a lot of daycare bills, right? So, but if I'm dishonest about what we need out of the company in order to achieve the promises that I've given the employees, right? That you will have benefits, you will have all these other things. I need to be, um, as that leader, I need to be confident in saying, you know, we need to make sure that we are going the extra mile for the next couple of weeks because we really need to nail it for this client because there's a lot of opportunity for the long term with these folks. And when I say that, that means not long term for me driving home in my Lambo, you know, like that <laughs> means that means opportunity for me to give you more profit sharing or better benefits or those types of things. And if I'm not clear and honest about those discussions, then I'm, I shouldn't be surprised if people don't want to go the extra mile. Do you always find that that honesty that okay, we're keeping it real. This is what we're after so that we can accomplish is met with understanding and hard mm -hmm. work. Or have you ever been surprised by a reaction yeah. on the other side? I have. Yeah. I've always tried to lead with why, right? This is why we're doing what we're doing. Not necessarily this is the results in whichever, right? The why. This is the type of company we want to become. This is the type of company we want to grow to. So these types of new challenges are why. Um, we are taking on this new piece of work. You might look at this new piece of work and say, well, we've never done anything like this before. Well, that's because we want to grow to where this 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 work could take us, right? So that's the why. But yes, I've had people say to me, I'm good where I'm at. I just want to stay here. And I was like, well, but that's not this company, right? The people who come to my company are people who want to grow. So that means the company has to grow. Because unless the employees stop growing, the company can't stop growing. What do you do to grow as a leader now? Oh, that's a good question. So I've always learned more, and you mentioned this, through other people's experiences than I did from books, right? I'm I'm much more of a, 
I don't know, a humanist than an academic. <laughs> you know, I read a lot. Obviously, I, I love to read. Um, I've written a book and I've always been a big reader. But honestly, doing the podcast has been really beneficial for my leadership because it is a show dedicated to inspiring and motivating leaders in technology and design. And so it's allowed me not only to open up um, some really interesting dialogues with people, but it's also allowed me to really diversify the my network and the people I'm talking to. So it's allowed me to really be intentional with seeking out other, you know, peers of mine, but also more non-white leaders, more women leaders, and, and learning from them on the challenges that they're having and the ways that my business can address those things. It's been really invaluable. So I just launched episode 210 of the show. Wow. And <laughs> thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and it's truly been a way for me to learn, right? I invite this leader on and I'm like, how do you do what you do? How do you make it. And I'm sure you probably are feeling the same way, right? Is that all these discussions you're having, it's constantly giving you new things to think about. It's expanding your mind in different ways. And so for me, I'm in a very similar spot with the show, but that's, that's been really helpful. But, you know, honestly, originally it was my father who taught me leadership and uh, he was a minister. And so I grew up as a preacher's kid and I thought, well, that's just a job. You get up every week and tell everybody how to live their lives. And then you go back home and have macaroni and cheese and hot dogs with, with your son, you know, like I thought that's what you did. Um, and so, uh, but I learned over time that, uh, you know, that was a skill set that he had to develop, um, took him many years to get there. And so, um, but I was fortunate to grow up in that environment. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. So I'm a practicing, uh, Christian myself, and I'm curious if, or how that growing up faith has impacted uh, your leadership journey today, or if that's something that you've you've moved away from for some reason. I think it's made. I think as you get older, I think it's natural that legacy starts to become a play in all the things that you're doing, what you're going to leave behind. But honestly, growing up in that environment, I think legacy came into my mind earlier than maybe my peers at the time. The idea of how am I going to leave the world a better place than I found it came to me at a much younger age, I feel, than many of my, like I said, many of my other peers. So I think that was probably the largest impact. The The phrase servant leadership comes to mind. Yeah. And I think that was like a buzzword for a while. Oh, sure. Like, yeah. You know, le- like, oh, yeah, we want to be servant leaders. OK, great. And then yeah, let's the do that. literature sort of moved on beyond that and said, well, actually, <laughs> you need to take care of yourself, too, and meditation and, and yes. self-care. And then you can be your best leader. <laughs> yes. Where are you on this spectrum of yeah. being there as a servant to the people around you versus other forms and philosophies around leadership? It's a constant, it's a constant balance. I used to have a boss that would say there's a scale and on one side is a, is a sweatshop and the other side is a free love hippie commune. And he's like, we always want to stay as close to the middle as we can. And we want, we want, we want, we can have variants over time. It's okay. But we want to stay as close to the middle as possible. And so for me, it's been about trying to achieve that balance between I want people to feel safe and protected, but I also need to see that, that the rewards are hard and, and financial and, and, and important that brings those people the gifts that they want in terms of the more free life, right? And the more stress-free life is that they don't have to worry so much about where their paycheck is coming from because we are working hard and we're working towards something for someone. So to me, it's all about trying to achieve that balance. And that's honestly, that's a daily practice from the moment I wake up until the moment I fall asleep. What are some signs that you recognize where things might be getting out of balance? Oh boy. Well, one for sure is uh, my anxiety, <laughs> just in general. Um, if I'm, if my anxiety is high, um, usually I'm pretty even keeled. If my anxiety is high, um, I know that something is out of balance somewhere, and I have to hunt it down and find out what that thing might be. It could be a family thing, it could be a friends thing, it could be a colleague, it could be work, um, it could be a personal goal, right? And so a lot of that, a lot of that comes from, you know, doing more self-reflective things, right? Like going for a walk, 
journaling, you know, just talking with a trusted friend who maybe isn't in the industry or business that you're in. So you can just, they don't understand what you're talking about, but they understand what you're talking about, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Those are the best um, friends. Yeah, right. So, so, so for me, it is about making sure that I seek for help outside of myself if I feel that balance is not happening because I'm the one who's probably created the problem. So I don't feel confident that I'm the one who's going to solve the problem. So I need to look outside to friends, to other support hacks and things, you know, Ben and Jerry's has been, they have those two consultants. That does the and, trick sometimes, you those, know, you reach the bottom of the <laughs> garden and go, wow, everything is better now. Uh, yeah. I was, ben and Jerry's have been great consultants of mine for years. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I highly recommend not just one, but both of them. Yeah. Well, your, your reliance on people, you know, you mentioned your, your yeah. podcast and your book is called the little book of, of networking. Yes. And so I, I I have found now I, we haven't done nearly as many episodes as you have, but you're totally right that in doing this show, which it wasn't a show, I am also an author. And the idea was to write a book. Yep. We started doing interviews and then we're like, damn, these interviews are really interesting and good. I wonder if we should do something with them before we do 99 and, and try and write a book out of them. And so that's where the, the actual podcast show came from, because it was they were fascinating. I was learning a lot. Yep. Same for Nadia, and, and she she pushed us really towards this direction, which which I've loved. But in your your world, it is a self care you know piece for you, but also a growth element. Yep. What what are some of the top tips for networking that, yeah. that you found really work for you to get what you need out of the other people around you and find them? Yeah, the first and so so I I love that you phrased it the way you did. Get out of people what you need because that's initially what people think of when when you think of networking. In my book, what I talk about is first thing we need to do is take stock of what value can we bring to other people. So the first thing that we need to do in networking is understand what sort of value can we bring to our network or to that potential network that we want to create. Is it is it could be as simple as access to your network that you already have built, right? It could be access to your uncle who works at MGM Studios and produces movie scripts, or it could be it could be a number of things um, that you have access to, or that you have uh, exclusive rights on, or whatever else that you can bring value to to other people. And once you take stock of that, then it is time to go out and find people um, who are willing to have those what I call micro partnerships, right? Because if you think about it, there's there's um, friends, right? Those are people like we invite to our wedding, right? And then there's people like we work with, which are people we spend eight hours a day with and we get to know, right? But, you know, it is, you know, we hope to work there for a year to eight years or whatever, you know, and then move on, right? In the middle is this gray area of what I call our network and those micro partnerships. So those are areas where we are trying to actively bring value to one another but we know that we're never going to go to each other's wedding and we probably aren't going to work together necessarily. It's possible because they say, you know, that the it's been, they've said for years, 70% of your next job comes from people, you know, well, wow. I, I haven't I heard believe, that, stat, but that feels right. I believe post pandemic, it's closer to 90%. And that's because in this country, we've had a lot of trust eroded between people, right? A lot of people want to know, you know, what sort of political side do you stand on? Who do you listen to? Who do you not listen to? Thanks to Twitter and a lot of different things, right? We've got a lot of, there's a lot of trust between ourselves that we have been broken down. We have spammers that are messaging us on LinkedIn all the time or you know, trying to get in our emails. They're trying to hack our Instagram accounts. So our trust level is at an all time low. So getting to know other people and networking in order to build up that safe group of people that you can go to with an ask is huge for your personal success. So we don't go to people and start asking for things. We go to people and start offering things. And then we ask them, you know, this is what I'm looking for too. What are you looking for? This is what I'm looking for. And we keep that routine going regularly. So in my book, I talk about how to build a system that allows you to maintain your network over time, because a lot of people, when they think networking, they think, oh, it's an event that's awkward. I put on a tag on my shirt that says, hello, my name is, 
and you try to awkwardly interrupt conversations that are already going on. That's not networking. That's just an event where you meet people. Networking is how you groom that, that, that group of people over time, how you add to it, how you delete people from it. Because as JFK famously said, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? So, so the goal is, is to, is to help each other, lift each other up. And that might not happen in the moment. It might happen five years from now with that person, but it will happen if you stay in contact with them, you stay top of mind and you keep that networking a priority. I, I remember an experience in my sort of leadership journey where one of my bosses and I took a trip and he was incredible with the leadership of a big major company. And I watched this dude just do his thing. Like he knew all their backstory Yep. and we were selling and then we were having fun and, you know, then we would go to dinner and that was amazing. And the energy was right. And we were gaining so much amazing knowledge at the same time. And we get to the end of the night and we get in the cab and we were in London. So we're looking at each other in the cab and I look at him yeah. and go, that was the most incredible thing. I could <laughs> never, ever do that. And he looks straight back at me and he goes, you just don't try hard enough. Yep. And I said, what do you mean? I try really, really, really hard. And he goes, no, you think I care about any of the stuff I just talked about? Nope. I had to doesn't. learn the rules of cricket last night. I had to yep. know this and this and this. Yep. And it, it dawned on me in that moment. And I think this is a point that you're making, but I'd love to hear your perspective yeah, yeah. is networking takes the work. It takes the preparation. If you're thinking of it as a personality trait yep. that some people are just good at and, and others are just bad at, you're right. really thinking about it in the wrong way. Yes, that's 100 percent correct. Yeah, I talk about it in the book because I have people say, well, I can't do networking. I've got a family and I'm like, that's BS. I know you're. I know you're binging The Last of Us. Don't, you know, stop it. Like, get get out there and meet some people and show them what value you have. And part of that value, to your point, what you had talked about your boss, part of his value was understanding the environment that he was in and bringing value into the conversation. And that's great, being able to bring in value into that conversation so people look at that person and say, wow, that's a person who I feel really listened to me, right? And just having, you know, how much value it is to have people around you that feel like you're being listened to that in itself, like who cares about money and jobs and all that stuff? I mean, give me somebody that I feel like is just actually really listening to me. How much of value is that? That's huge value. So it isn't about, like I said, I, and I talk about it in the book, just being a good listener is a lot of value to people. So you don't necessarily have to be some big CEO who has a ton of people that uh, jobs you can just throw around and money you can throw around at people. When I first became a certified coach, one of the things that I would say was how amazing it was, how many people cried around me all of a sudden, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. oh, everyone's crying now when I'm a coach. <laughs> yeah. And really, for me, at least the biggest thing I learned was the, the listening skill, how to practice it, how to use it. And to your point, that value, just how different it is. We don't listen to each other. Yes. And when you do, it feels like a totally different conversation. It really does. It really does. And and again, if you think about the higher, you know, they say, right, heavy wears the crown, right? So the higher you go up in these organizations, the more lonely these leaders are. And the less they have people leave. That's why they join these groups like Vistage and all, everything else to, to find other people who they can identify with. And those are that's how lots of great deals are created between organizations because they're going to places where they feel like these are people that understand them and who know them, right? And um, that's how great marketing and sales is done in the first place is you just, you know who you're talking to, you know what their problems are, you have advice or solutions or something and that's super helpful. Um, but if they don't know you exist, what good does it do anybody? <laughs> mm. it, so is what you're saying, because this is something that I think people say is it, it's lonely at the top. Yeah. Is it lonely because fewer and fewer people around you relate to you? Or what is it that makes it yeah. lonely? It is. It is. It's fewer people relate to you. Because I remember, you know, being being hungry to climb the ladder, as it were, in my in my late 20s, right? And I remember thinking like, how do I get a seat at that table? Because I'd see like leadership having these closed door 
meetings about things. And I'd be like, I could contribute to that meeting. I know. And then I remember when I got to that table, I was like, how the hell do I get away from this table? (laughs) (laughs) This is, this is ridiculous. Nothing is getting done. Nothing is, you know, and, and so I learned very quickly, be careful what you wish for, because at that table, what you're having to do now is not only now are you managing your team, but you're managing laterally, right? You're managing other people that are in that leadership position with you. And then sometimes you have to manage up like that could be if it's a large company, it could be shareholders, right? But it could just be investors, could be a CEO or a board member or a board of some kind, right? So you're managing up, you're managing across and you're managing down. It's, it's, it's hell, right? And, and so the further up you get, the, the, the less people understand what the value is that you bring. They just know you're in charge, right? And honestly, the less you understand the value you bring, right? I used to work for a boss. We had a, as a company about 500 some people and he would introduce himself as the chief solitaire player. <laughs> does that did that work for him or was yeah, it that did. you know <laughs> it did yeah because his job all day was just making decisions that was his job he didn't produce anything he didn't create anything and i think it drove him kind of crazy to be honest with you i think that's why he introduced himself like that because he didn't like it but he was the person who just had to make decisions what should we do about this these people want money should we give it to him these people want to give us money. Should we take it from them? You know, that's all they did all day was make decisions. How do you see your role and relationship to that? Is it also yeah. a pure decision making role? Or a lot of it is. See? Yeah, a lot of it is just making decisions and pretending I have a crystal ball and being able to see what a year out looks like and and planning for it. Mm-hmm. Right. And And then so what I've done to supplement that is that the podcast, the book writing, the article, you know, I do a newsletter on LinkedIn. I do a lot of speaking events. I'm on podcasts. Thank you very much. And, and, and that sort of stuff has helped ground me back into the idea of being able to make things, be able to produce something. And it really scratches that itch because my team does not want me producing user experience designs. They don't want me writing software code. I'll tell you that they would lose their minds if I did because I'm terrible at it now. And and so that's not my role. That's not the benefit I bring to the organization anymore. So I always tell people, why do you hire me? Well, it's because I'm from the future. Mm. I've already done everything you're about to do and and I've screwed it up a lot. And so I'm here now to help make sure you don't. It's neat how you've created this you know, you're saying, you know, scratching your, your itch there, but they're fueling each other. It sounds like, right? Oh, for sure. Yes. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. They absolutely do fuel each other. And so that goes back to what you were asking about that balance, right? Is that I know that if um, work is extremely hard and I have a lot of um, decisions I have to make, and I have a lot of choices that I'm not quite a hundred percent confident in, is that I do have the ability to go back and have some control over my world a little bit in the book and the authorship and those types of things as a, as sort of my sort of a backup in my career. Right. Obviously I have other activities. I, you know, I have four children. I love to play with the kids. We're taking them to Disney world this next weekend. And, and my wife is amazing. I'm just trying to keep up with her because she is an incredible executive at her place of business. And, And it's, and for me, I have all of that, but in terms of how I feel like I am leaving behind the world, a better place than I, I found it, it can't just be this company. That's not enough. Mm. What's the, what's the ride everybody's looking most forward to at Disney world? You know, right now, my six-year-old says he doesn't want to do anything that has loop-de-loops. Okay. So that um, rules out quite a few then. It does. So honestly, my, I think, you know, because I'm the dad and he's six, I'm going to say ride of the resistance is probably the one oh, that, we're, <laughs> nice. that, we're, that we're most excited about. Um, I love it. I haven't done it yet, but I've heard good things. I've heard good things too. I heard that it breaks down a lot too. So I'm hoping, <laughs> fingers crossed. I hope you're there for a few days. <laughs> you just know, in case. Yeah. Well, Kurt, as we as we get ready to wrap up yeah. here, you, you said something quite interesting there that the company is not enough. Yeah. And I'm curious if you know what enough would be. 
Hmm. You know, honestly, that's not the the point. Is not to achieve a goal. The point is to have goals. the 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 point is not to arrive at a destination. It's to stay on a journey. If I ever got to a destination, I just I'd redraw the map, anyways. You know, so so I've always lived my life by this ten 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 sort of philosophy, which is ten years, ten months, ten weeks. So I have a ten year goal. This is something I want a life changing sort of thing, right? So I want to I want to retire in Siena, Italy, and live in a nice medieval city and drink espresso and watch the horse racing and blah blah blah. That's ten year goal. So. What can I do? You know, what milestone could I achieve in 10 months that would help me achieve that goal? Right. So it could be it could be looking for clients in Italy. It could be or getting a client in Italy or something like that or, you know, in our surrounding country. And then what can I do in 10 weeks that gets me close to that goal? Well, I could start learning Italian. So yeah. so for me. It's about the journey. And, you know, like the James Bond movie said the world is never enough right the idea is is to keep growing and to keep building because if we stop growing what's the point of being here hmm. i don't know if you're a, a brandon sanderson fan at all amazing author and journey before destination is one yes. of the, the central tenets and it really resonates because that idea of growth, I, I love that. And chunking it into smaller and smaller pieces makes that big, big, big goal. Exactly. Actually... Right. Because I'm no different than anybody else. Just And you had mentioned, right? Like, you know, we've been fortunate to win some awards at the company and I wrote a book and all these things. But I have the same demons that come to me every night, just like everybody else does is that you're you're not good enough. Who cares? Why do you, who do, you know, for, you know, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, who do you think you are? I have those same demons everybody else has. Sure. Um, but my only way to get through them is to challenge those things and to be able to say, well, I've set these goals. So, you know, if I screw up, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen that I never started on the journey? And I can't look back at myself and say, I never, I never tried. That's unacceptable. Well, Kurt, for what it's worth, it is obvious to me that you are an amazing human leader that you show up for your team, that you're thinking about how to better yourself, learn from the mistakes. For those out there that are striving to be, you know, great human leaders themselves, if you were to give them one piece of advice, what would it be? You know, honestly, I would first say, hold up the mirror, right? What could you be doing better? If you're frustrated with your team, if you're frustrated with your place where things are at, if you feel like the world is kind of collapsing around you, grab a mirror and, and look in it really deep. What are you doing to improve yourself and to to grow and get better at what you're doing before you start going around and yelling at other people or telling people you're disappointed or anything like that? Hold up the mirror first, and I guarantee you it will make you a much more approachable, much more valuable, and honestly, a much more authentic leader. Amazing. Thank you so much. Kurt, where can people connect with you, find you if they want to yeah. hear more? Yeah. So the podcast is called Schmidt List. Uh, so it's always, always fun to ask people to come on my Schmidt List and or get on my Schmidt List. Uh, I like that. And so, yeah, that's on YouTube and on and, uh, all the places you can find podcasts. But I'm probably most active on LinkedIn. So if you just search for Kurt with a K, Kurt Schmidt and Schmidt like the beer, you know, it's pretty easy to find me. I've got a newsletter there. And uh, yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody who listens to this and either has words of praise or words of challenge, because I would love to I'd love to go a few rounds with someone. I love that. The challenge always makes us better. And I know you you hopefully will have tips for me on this podcast as a more experienced podcaster. We'll put all of those links in the show notes for people to read and click on and engage with you. Thank you again for coming on 99 Humans. Really great to, to talk with you. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Kurt. Bye. Bye.